Engage. Disrupt. Adapt. Repeat. You're listening to Pure Reinvention, the podcast for curious people. Welcome to this episode of the Pure Reinvention Podcast, the community of change seekers and curious professionals that are looking for a little support as they go on their journeys. As you know, these podcasts are intended to share stories of other people who are trying to incorporate reinvention in their everyday lives, and we hope you're learning something from these valuable conversations. Mike, would you care to talk about our interview today? Well, we were really excited to first make acquaintance with Josh a couple of years ago. He was a part of our strategic planning for ASA 2015. And it was during that time that we could see that Josh really had a passion for Detroit. And as as people get a chance to listen to uh, all of his thoughts regarding Detroit, um, they will see how much of a passion that he really has. But that conversation has continued on, and uh, obviously then today today we were fortunate enough to capture him on a podcast, and our listeners, I think, will just absolutely be thrilled with the content that we were able to capture from Josh, um, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, from an investor standpoint. Uh, Josh is a, has written a couple of best-selling books, um, quite a guy. And if you are going to be at the ASAE annual meeting coming up August 8th through the 11th, you'll get to hear Josh deliver the opening general keynote at the general session Sunday morning, August 9th. I believe that starts at 830, but it's something you won't want to miss. I've seen Josh speak a couple of times and I've read his books and he's a really smart guy and this interview will kind of be a nice teaser to see what he's talking about and I know you'll learn a lot from him. Josh is, Josh is the person who really is the is a great example of, of why Detroit. Um, he's able to communicate with his words and his passion the stories of Detroit and to really bring out how important it is that Detroit be looked at as a learning laboratory, a place where today you can come and learn about these certain things. However, remember, you can come back tomorrow and there'll be new and different things to talk about. So he's, he's on this lifelong understanding of why Detroit, and I think we should be too. Well, and he's a local guy. He was born and raised there, so he has that um, you know personal connection, which always makes it more interesting, and you're able to tell a better story when you're personally connected to it. Yes. Misty, the content was so good. We do have to let people know that we did struggle a little bit with some of our um, quality uh, I want to. I, I, I suggested perhaps it was just a couple of electric uh, personalities coming together and and so forth. But anyway, uh, you'll you'll try to maybe adjust your sound and may not have much success. But really focus in on the content because it's the content that Josh shares, which is just so magical. It's well worth a listen, and uh, we hope you enjoy. Welcome to this edition of Pure Reinvention. We're excited today to welcome Josh Linkner. Josh is an a, uh, investor in Detroit, an entrepreneur, and more importantly lives here. Welcome, Josh. Thanks. Great to be here. Josh, there's a lot of buzz going on about Detroit. You've been here for your whole life, actually multi-generation. Why is there such a buzz about Detroit? Well, Detroit is a city with a soul. I mean, we have such rich history here of innovation, of entrepreneurship, of, of breakthrough creativity. And as we know, we sort of lost our way for many decades. And unfortunately, we got away from some of those attributes and our city suffered greatly. Uh, but what's exciting right now is that we are rising from the ashes to a degree, and reconnecting with some of those core entrepreneurial roots that put us on the map in the first place. And um, I believe that what's happening today is unprecedented, and in fact, will be recognized for decades to come as the greatest turnaround story in American history. You bring up a really important point, and that is that Detroit has a degree of experience that maybe no other municipality has, and it's coming back from the ashes. And Detroit really had a choice, didn't it? Well, it did. You know, we, we could have kept longing for the days that have gone by and pointing fingers and casting blame, but um, I feel that finally all of us in the community, ranging from the, the elected officials to the, the community leaders to the business folks, are really aligned. We're, we're aligned in creating a new Detroit, not rebuilding the old Detroit. It's funny, a lot of times people say it's a comeback. I think it's more like a come forward because we're not trying to be the old Detroit. We're not trying to be someone else, something right, authentic. Right. We're crafting something new and unique that's based on our heritage and roots but has, has so much more potential going forward. How were we able to break this pattern and establish this whole new pattern of doing business differently? Well, it, it should be noted that it didn't happen for quite some time. I mean, we were really stuck in the mud. And I think a number of factors happened. I, I've heard it said that we had the, the perfect storm between uh, you know, auto, auto companies hurting and, and corruption and, and inefficiency and racial divisiveness and all these issues that brought us down. I think now we're in the middle of a perfect sunny day. And so there are a number of factors that are driving this reinvention forward. 
Uh, first of all, we hit rock bottom, and I think we had to hit rock bottom for us to to, to really all agree we got to stop doing this. It's not working. And that was probably 2008, something like that. Yes. Um, from there, the bankruptcy was an important step forward, and and I, I say that with sen- great sensitivity because I know that affected human beings. But um, we had to let go of the past in order to find the possibilities of the future. And what that did is allowed us to shed this unmanageable debt load and go forward. And then, and then just to, to round it out, I think what's happening now is that we have great leadership in so many different areas. We have a business-minded governor. We have a business-minded mayor. A lot of that corruption infighting has been broomed out. We have business leaders like Dan Gilbert and, and Mike Illich that are uh, pouring not only their, their hearts and souls, but, of course, their investment dollars into our city. We have federal support. We have foreign investment. So in the same way that all these factors, it was a confluence of factors that brought us down. Today, there's those that same confluence of factors, of positive ones, that are bringing us up. So with this great story, no great story goes without being told. You are a New York Times bestselling author. How were you able to understand what this story was? Well, the story is is complex, but it doesn't take you know years of study to figure out. I mean, in, in fact, it's been a classic story and a classic rise and fall of empires and people and companies where once great creative entities, people, it doesn't matter, companies, civilizations, um, ultimately uh, their downfall becomes hubris and, and intolerance and an unwillingness to change, a deep commitment to the past instead of looking forward. And, and that happened to Detroit, frankly. And so that pattern we've seen play out throughout history, and the pattern of redemption is what's happening now. And, and it's so exciting. By the way, I tell the story of Detroit all over the world. I was in, in Austin, Texas yesterday in front of 1,500 people, uh, and, and I, you know, I write about it and speak all over the world. And there is this deep connection, uh, this powerful connection with the city of Detroit. I think everyone can relate to being the underdog at some point in their life. And uh, I'll tell you, people, it, it resonates. It, it hits people. They come up to me afterward. They don't want to talk about my other stuff. They want to talk about Detroit. And, right. and what do they ask you? It, a few different categories. In some cases, there's still the sense of disbelief. It's one of these, all right, come on. What's the really real story? Sure here? Yeah. And, and I understand that because, you know, we were our own worst enemy. Oh, yeah. You compare Detroit to New Orleans. We both had horrible catastrophes, but, but people had more empathy for, for New Orleans because it was a natural disaster. Ours were self-inflicted wounds. So there's a little bit of skepticism, I'll say. Um, but the, the more uh, po- more common questions that I get are around, wow, tell me more about that. And there's like this deeply personal uh, spirit and, 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 and gut feeling. I think the neat thing about the Detroit story, there are some stories that, that connect you intellectually with your head. You talk about, uh, oh, the rise of Silicon Valley or something. It's a little bit more of a heady type thing. Yes. Um, Detroit connects to your heart and connects to your gut. Because it's a very human experience. This was the, the you know the sort of heartbeat of, of, of our country, and to see a city that suffered so greatly that's now on the upswing, uh, it's a very emotional kind of thing, and, and people really connect with. It. So when you are uh, communicating to these groups, you're finding a lot of curiosity about Detroit. A lot of curiosity, and and they want to then people want to extract the lessons because ah. when you see something as powerful as the turnaround of a big complex problem and an incredibly vibrant community, yeah. they say, wow, what can I learn from that? How can I apply that to my situation, my company, my life, my family, my community? And so there's a lot of that, like, wow, this could be kind of the, uh, the oracle that's going to allow me to win in my own existence. ASAE is coming to town. You are the keynote speaker. Give us some sense and some uh, insight into, into what that message is going to be. This is a huge deal for our city. I mean, I don't know if people yes, really is. understand this, but but there are 5,000 leaders of associations coming to Detroit, Michigan for their annual big conference. These people will, and I just was on the phone with them yesterday, for every dollar that's invested here this summer, we'll create a $10 immediate impact in additional tourism and conferences and events that happen in Detroit. But even more than that, symbolically, these are major influencers that represent hundreds of thousands or millions of members. So the impact that this one event this summer in Detroit can make um, will we'll have a long-term and profound impact. So it's an important work. We're on bright light stage here. we got to put our best foot forward. Uh, but that's going to make a big difference as our city continues to rebound. Oh, there is so much in Detroit. And one of the things that, you know, as, as we work to, to help you know, win this, this conference here this summer, uh, that we said is Detroit is, is unique. It's not just some, you know, stamped out mall type city. I mean, there's, there's so much rich, unique heritage here. Uh, and the other thing is it's sort of a learning laboratory. It's like this live experiential uh, place where people can come to to see what happens when you create and innovate, to see what happens when you don't. And so to me, I think it's such a powerful, uh, emotionally charged experience that you can't get in any other city. And absolutely, there's reasons to come back. I mean, this is an ideal place to hold a meeting, conference, or an event. 
It's an ideal place to bring teams to, to get their, to roll up their sleeves and, and really dive into to the, to the real fabric of what creativity and innovation can be all about. For those that are looking to, to push the envelope, to, to grow their own leadership skills, to grow their organization, you know, leadership development is kind of job number one. But the problem is, and we know study after study shows that sitting in some dimly lit classroom style environment being talked at it is it, with, with no ex, no stimuli. That's not how you learn. That that maybe worked 50 years ago, but it certainly doesn't work today. And so, what works the most is to create these multi-sensory, sort of high-impact experiential learning opportunities. And Detroit has that uh, in, in tenfold. I mean, you can sit in some uh, Hilton ballroom somewhere and, and listen to some lecturer, you know, drone on with PowerPoint slides, or you can come to a Men- the actual Edison's Menlo Laboratory that's at the Henry Ford campus. And, and, and be completely immersed in, in this rich sense of history that, that, that exists nowhere else. So I think we offer these assets that can't be found elsewhere that really will drive forward leadership development and will drive forward progress. Education as a whole, not just with kids, but with, with adult learning too. Is, maybe particularly so with adults. Right, is, is shifting dramatically. The thing is that the old model of learning maybe made sense for an era that, that is, is decades old. So if the goal is to teach people to follow the rules, guess what the teacher knows? There's only one right answer. And the primary goal of education was compliance, memorization, and obedience. Great. That old style works fine. But that ain't how it works no more. Right. And so to be an effective leader today, to drive an effective organization today, that, that rote memorization, follow the rule book, is just completely inadequate. And what we need today is we need to train people to be creative problem solvers, to think on their feet, to make decisions in the face of ambiguity. And those skills can only be developed in a situation that touches on all the senses and is far more immersive. So we are not a utopia yet. We're not at the goal line yet. We're in the early innings. But I will say that what I see, the momentum, the trajectory, the speed in which change is happening is profound. Here's a model. And you can see in real time, while this transformation is happening, what is working and what didn't work. And so I think you can learn sometimes not only from successes, but from setbacks and challenges. We can show both in real time. If you have this convention in San Francisco or or Boston, which are great cities, you come back 10 years from now, maybe you see a new restaurant. I mean, you come back 10 years to Detroit, you won't even recognize this. And and I think it's also a a very real, authentic, gritty sense of of learning that you can't get somewhere else. It's an, it's an, it's a profound experience. In other words, you know, Disney World is an experience, but it's very manicured and, and, and carefully very orchestrated controlled. and very controlled. Yes. And whereas Detroit has this rawness to it, this this resilience, this grit, grit, tenacity, this ability to watch growth happen in real time. And to me, doesn't that align with how successful companies also operate? The best leaders, best companies are focused, they're obsessed, they crave what's next, what's next. And I, I think a good analogy, even though Perhaps Apple is an overused story, but but not this aspect of it. You know, Apple started out with with a lot of fanfare, Apple Two E and such, and and it was very successful. But then, you know, a significant downfall, almost hit bankruptcy. I mean, Jobs was fired, Jobs came back, and this company was on fumes. And then after that downfall, Apple, of course, shot up and, and and achieved the impossible. That's the story of Detroit. In other words, we were successful in the past. We had a downfall, and and now we're rising up. We've turned the corner. We're rising up. But boy, our best days, our best days are not looking back, it's looking forward. And our, our our trajectory is gonna thrust us to the point where we're gonna look back from a peak and look way down on our previous successes. Uh, and, and so to me, that's why it's such a neat place to come and visit and learn and explore. I mean, my parents, grandparents, and I were, were all born in the city of Detroit, and I, I this is home and, and I care deeply about it from a community standpoint. Uh, besides that, those are attributes that I'm attracted to, being an entrepreneur. Um, each of the businesses that I've built. We're not just you know a replica of some existing model. It was we, we completely changed things up, and I had some successes and failures, by the way. Oh, sure. but, but the point is that um, that that's kind of a sense of who I am and what I really believe and what I value is that you know grittiness, scrappy determination that really has built our country. If you look at it. so reinvention, which is the topic of my most recent book, The Road to Reinvention, um, is a very misunderstood word. Uh, and so often, uh, leaders feel overwhelmed by it. Like, I have to completely reinvent every aspect of my business. And so they make it a once-a-decade effort, and it's a bet-the-farm, you know. Kind of like how we do strategic planning. Yeah, exactly. And and that's why it's often ineffective. The best of the best take a different approach. The best of the best think of reinvention as an ongoing process. And so they're always reinventing little aspects of their business. So a thoughtful, less scary, and more productive approach would be, let's say you have several different aspects of your business. You have sales. You have your product, you have customer experience, you have your culture, you have your distribution strategy, your marketing, etc. You ident- you isolate one area, reinvent that, while the others are still staying stable. Once you get the benefit of that new reinvented, reinvented area, you then sort of move on to the next one. 
So taking a more disciplined, systematic approach to reinvention drives way better outcomes. The title of my first book was called Disciplined Dreaming. And the whole uh, issue there was to juxtapose these two seemingly unrelated words. But that's, that's, again, that's how startups win, but that's how big companies are winning today. If a company has all discipline and no dreaming, you end up with a clunky, bureaucratic swamp that, that can't get out of its own way. Yes. On the other hand, if you have all dreaming and no discipline, you have pets.com that you know flames out and goes out of business. Yes. So to me, the intersection, the yin and yang of having both a disciplined approach, but at the same time, enabling creative breakthrough thought and, and enabling a culture that supports risk-taking and the imagination, that is the formula for, for winning. Today. About that combination, either has really disciplined approach, or we now have this very creative entrepreneur. How do we balance those two? Well, you hit the word the nail on the head with the word balance, and, and much easier say to do, said than, than done, of course. Yes. And yeah, it's common sense, but common sense isn't always common practice. Right. I think one thing we have to avoid as leaders is the overcorrect. In other words, if you have this loosey goosey organization and it's real sloppy and everything is all you know too too creative, and you have a bad outcome or a bad short term outcome, the instinct is to swing the pendulum to almost militaristic. Uh, type type uh, administration, which also has its own downfall. Self-correcting to an extreme. Right. So what that is, that's like the whack-a-mole game. You know, you knock down one problem, and the next problem pops up. Yep. So it's striking the right balance, and, and where you, when you when you do get off track, because things don't often stay perfectly aligned, is not is is avoiding the urge to overcorrect and having sort of the, the discipline, if you will, to stay balanced with both of those competing factors. Help me to understand, or any company using Detroit as the model. Are we encouraging leaders? to get into their own marketplace and walk the streets. I think it's, that's a great point. I mean, you know, getting getting in the trenches, you know, the ivory tower leadership doesn't really cut it. In fact, my whole philosophy of leadership is that leaders are servants, they're not kings. In other words, if, if you work really hard and you get to the corner office and you achieve some success, your instinct might be to, you know, boss people around and think that everybody works for you. Yeah. And that that's a failing uh, approach in, in these challenging times. I think a better approach is quite the opposite. It's flipping that upside down. In fact, if you make it to the corner office, the people that you work for are those that you serve. Yes. And if you think of yourself as a servant instead of a king, the king is that your people and the king is the company you're there to serve, that applies, that, that ultimately it drives way better outcomes. So how do we shift the paradigm so that what we have that's special and unique is, spell, is still special and unique, even though everybody has full access? Well, what, it, what it has to, to do with is uh, finding a new competitive advantage. So in the past, controlling information or controlling geography, I mean, if you were the local jewelry store, you controlled geography in the past, but now we live in a global market. So what I think we have to do is recognize that because the world is changing at a rate like none other in history, and because many of the competitive advantages we've had in the past have become commoditized, our job as leaders, whether it's an association leader or an individual leader or even looking after our own career, is to find new points of differentiation. So to always be finding that little spot that makes us a category of one solution instead of blending in with the rest of the pack. And so, as you point out, just having access to information, everybody has that. Information is ubiquitous. So now it's the shift of what can you do with that information to make you a unique solution to, to those that you serve. The one thing I think is important is, is encouraging courage. Fear is the single biggest blocker of creative thinking. It's not natural talent, and the research is very clear. All of us have enormous creative capacity. Maybe we're not all artists, but we all have capacity to solve problems in creative ways. The problem that gets in our way is that poisonous fear, which robs us of our best thinking. And we talk ourselves out of sharing our best ideas because we don't want to be uh, look foolish. We don't want to be uh, slapped on the hand. So as leaders, if we can encourage courage, recognizing that if we want great, big breakthrough ideas, we got to have a lot of bad ideas along the way to get there, and encouraging imagination and creative thought, that's an important thing. It's building a culture that supports creative risk-taking. Now, too many companies have these platitudes in the lobby. We support innovation. We're all about imagination. And they say it, but then the minute someone comes forward with a half-baked idea, they, they get sent to time out. Uh, that's not the way to lead. The way to lead is to recognize that the biggest natural resource that all organizations have at their disposal is not uh, oil or cash or real estate. It's, it's human imagination. It's the brain power of their teams. And so hiring people for their judgment and forcing them to never use it is not the way to work. The way to work is to harness that imagination, bring it to the surface, and let it shine. You heard it from Josh Linkner, uh, New York Times bestselling author, keynote speaker, ASA 2015. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Wow. See what I mean? That could have gone on forever. Outstanding, huh? He's a smart guy and he has a lot to share. I can see why he's written a couple of books. He gets really excited when he talks about Detroit as well as he should. He's been able to see it with a front row seat. 
very well connected to the key leaders. He understands from so many different perspectives what's what's really happening in Detroit. And he really understands the the way in which uh, organizations, both associations and for profits, really need uh, to kind of incorporate some of these thought processes that he's uh, introducing and 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 move them forward because they are the way the opportunities that um, all businesses can take advantage of. I got a little chuckle out of the fact that uh, he said he was just in in Texas. And still, after all of the great stories and great information he shares, at the end of the speech, people want to talk about Detroit and how they can learn and interact from the city. Yeah, Detroit is a wonderful curiosity that people don't know really what to think about Detroit because it's had so many years where Detroit has really just struggled. Yet they do understand that isn't really what's happening today, but they're not quite sure what it is. And that's what makes it so perfect to be able to define what it is that Detroit has to offer because people have this curiosity, but there isn't this hard definition. There is a definition of the past, but they know that past has changed. And so to allow people to uh, invite people to come to Detroit and walk our city and be curious about what's happening, as Josh says, it just makes a perfect place for you to incubate in your own mind future opportunities. Well, this is because it's real time. And I know that word word was used in your conversation with Josh and it's true. This is happening live right in front of you. So you go go down to the city this weekend and you're going to see something different the next time you return. It is, it's really what's working and what's not happening all the time there. Misty, there's something very attractive about getting into real time. Um, everybody kind of does the data dump with a PowerPoint, but what is in uh, such short supply is the real-time learning opportunities and experiences that Detroit's able to capitalize on because it is uh, producing that content on a daily basis. And as uh, Josh said, this is the place for people to be who are ready for that kind of an experience. It's fast. It's exciting. It isn't for everybody. And and I think he even made a point of saying you have to be careful. There's so much that you can't just throw it all into your company. You have to be very careful about how you kind of feed it in and how you manage it but it's all here for you to take advantage of and discover and decide what part you're going to own so you can take it to your um, customers and to your membership. I agree. I, th- I just heard um, Detroit Tigers general manager in a quote uh, about a recent game. He said, you know, we on paper, this is how the game looks and it's great, but we play on the grass. And I just thought that was so relevant to what's happening in Detroit all over. They're, they're playing on the grass, they're playing on the streets, they're taking it to businesses at every level. I think that's such a wonderful point, Misty, because on the, uh, you know, a company has the strategic plan and in their mind they may understand what's happening. But what's really important is for a company to evaluate how it's playing on the grass, as you said, or, or at the customer level. And Josh is very wired into that. He's very wired into what customers need, how we've kind of missed a lot of opportunities to satisfy those needs, yet they're still there. That's right. He also mentioned that it, well, what he really gets is um, how the adult learner works and that they need multi-sensory, dynamic, engaging experiences. Being in the professional world, we're constantly learning and making in-flight transitions and coming to Detroit, you can see that happening. But when you want to learn something new, you also need to learn something new in that same space. To be able to get into what you're learning exactly, as opposed to sitting on the outside and looking in but to actually be able to get into whatever that model is, is in very short supply. And Detroit has a lot of it. I think we learned a lot from Josh. We have a part two coming up with Josh. So stay tuned for that in the coming week. If you're ready to make a change, make it a change that lasts. Make it pure reinvention. Thanks for listening to this episode of Pure Reinvention. Keep the conversation going and get alerts when new podcasts are up by following us on Twitter at Pure Reinvention or sign up for our mailing list at pureinvention.com.